What's up, church? Tell for love. Let's stand up to our feet. Welcome to the house of God this morning. Let's show you some joy as we worship the King of Kings in this place. Hallelujah. We're going to sing out. How about you, weary?
of the world. For God so loved, for God so loved. Sing that one more time. For God so loved the world. Come on. For God so loved, for God so loved. Amen. Let's worship our God in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you, God. Yes, Lord, you loved us so much that you sent your son to the cross. Church, let's just begin to thank God this morning. Come on, there's so much to be grateful for this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercy. We thank you, Lord. You are our strength. You are our hope. Lord, it doesn't matter what we go through, Lord. We serve the one and true King, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord God. Father, let your presence be found in this place. Amen, church. Let's sing out. You are my strength. You are my strength. Strength like no other. Strength like no other. Reaches. Reaches to me. Let's sing out. You are my hope. You are my hope. Hope like no other. Hope like no other. It reaches to me. Reaches to me. Amen. Let's sing out in the fullness. In the fullness of your grace. In the power of your name. You live me Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's continue to worship our God in this place. We worship the King of Kings who conquered the grave. Yes, Lord.
Amen. Let's declare that this morning. Let's sing out the head that once was crowned. Yeah, yeah.
anointing amen to fall upon our pastor let's also pray uh, for our first responders those that labor in the front line let's really ask for God's protection upon them let's also pray for these laborers out there uh, pastor field uh, and, and Straff, uh, Strathpine and pastor Olson and uh, the USA let's pray for these leaders of these nations let's really lift up God and believe God to really uh, bring revival in these churches and these cities let's also pray every personal need whatever you have I encourage you we're here in the holy house of, of Jesus Christ, and I encourage you to give it all to God this morning. We believe for great things, amen. And with that being said, I'm going to ask our brother, uh, Lotto, if you can come open us up in a word of prayer, amen. Let us pray, church. Our uh, Father, we thank you, God, for what you're doing in this place this morning, Lord. We give you glory and praise, Lord. This Lord, God, we're so grateful, God, that we can be in your presence, God, this morning, God. Lord, we pray, God, that you'll continue to have your anointing, God, upon our service, God, upon our pastors and ministers, your word, Father. We pray, God, that you'll speak to our soul, God, bring a heart of conviction, God. I pray, Jesus, upon every first responder, military, God, may you continue to protect them as they protect us, God. I pray, Jesus, upon Pastor Field, God, Pastor Olson, God, and Shephine and Tempe, and say, Father, may you continue, God, to pour out your revival, God, upon these churches, God, may you continue to raise up disciples, Lord. I pray, God, upon every person on need, Father. We at the foot of your cross, believing God that you'll bring deliverance, God. We pray, God, bless this morning, God, bless our service, God. We give you back all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. We all say, Amen. Thank you, Jesus, God. We worship you, Father. Thank you, Lord, God. Morning, church. Why don't we welcome up each other? Amen. Praise God. Welcome out to our morning service this morning. We're glad that you could join with us for our Sunday morning service. Uh, just before we get into the Word of God, amen, we've got a few announcements, some exciting announcements coming up within the next few weeks. So starting with tonight, uh, we've got our evening service at 6.30 p.m., 5.30 for prayer. Pastor's going to be preaching a, a sermon called The Hardest Word to Say. So I'm excited for what that word is going to be. So I encourage you, come along, bring some along with you, and I will see God do great things tonight. Amen. Also looking ahead, 
tomorrow we've got a men's discipleship at uh, the Hamilton Church. So for all the men, uh, you want to build your discipleship, you want to build your manlyhood, I encourage you to come over to Hamilton. If you need a ride, speak to your connect leader and uh, we'll, we'll suss that out tomorrow, uh, for tomorrow. Amen. Also looking ahead, uh, we've, we're on our last week of our Fit for Purpose Weight Loss Challenge. So this week, amen, praise God, we've got our Tuesday, Thursday trainings. Our brother uh, Jaden and T, I think, are going to be running those two sessions. And then uh, we're going to head into our breakup on the 21st of this Saturday. This Saturday, we're going to be having our breakup. Going to be an exciting time. I encourage you uh, to, to be there, to come and support, and um, just be, you know, willing to help out for this uh, event. It's going to be pretty massive. We've got many teams signed up, and most of them are visitors. So I encourage you uh, to be, uh, be there where you can. Uh, talk to someone new, and I will see God do great things this weekend. Amen. We're also looking ahead. We've got uh, some, some impact teams on the 28th of this month. At the end of the month, we've got an impact team to Manarewa, our baby church, and uh, Odohu. We've got Anointed and Harvest going to Rewa, and uh, Agape, Fearless, RMP, and Waymakers heading to Odohu. So your Connect leaders, uh, they'll give you more information about that as we draw closer to that time. Amen. Also looking ahead, uh, we've got Pastor Johnny Nguyen coming for us as Pastor announced on our Ignite prayer. Uh, this is going to be a solid time. We've got him uh, for the Sunday. We've got him preaching uh, our morning service. And then uh, for our evening service, he'll be sharing his powerful testimony. Amen. I'm really excited for that. So I encourage you from now onwards, invite someone out and we'll see uh, God save more people, more gangsters around the area. Whatever it is, whoever they are, God can save them. Amen. And also looking ahead, we've got our, our Auckland's Got Talent Night here in the building. Amen. It's going to be an exciting time. So I encourage you, if you have a talent or you think you've got a talent, sign your name up and um, we'll see what you got. The judges will be around to judge that. We're going to be having some prizes as well. And um, yeah, we'll see God move that night as well. And our final, pr uh, final announcement is morning prayer. Uh, the building is open for morning prayer from whatever time Luke jumps in, uh, opens up. So I encourage you, speak, speak to the, your leaders or your ushers. Uh, and they'll be here to open up. Amen. That's all of our announcements. Why don't we give God praise as all the ushers come up to the front. Amen. <laughs> Father, we thank you, Jesus, and we worship you tonight, God. We honor you in our giving. Amen. This morning, let's continue to give cheerfully and give with a grateful heart, for knowing what God has done, not only in our lives, but, you know, in the lives of our church and um, what God is building here. So let's continue to give cheerfully this morning. And as, as we do that, our brother Richard, if you could bless our offering. God. Amen. God bless as you give this morning. Let's sing out. Come all you weary. Come all you weary. Come all you thirsty. Come to the well and never much shine. Drink on the water. Come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners. Come all you sinners. God appreciate singers, musicians. Didn't they do a good job this morning? Some new songs, and uh, we appreciate them leading us into worship. I want to welcome you all out here to the Potter's House Church. And um, in 2013, we started our church over there in Onihanga, and uh, God did great things. We moved three buildings in Onihanga, and um, then we're moving in o Otara, and then Mount Eden, and now we're over here at Alexandra Park. And um, I was talking to Pastor Elliot. I'm like, what do we do about our name? Because we've been in Onihanga for eight years. How do we? It's weird. Like, welcome to the Potter's House, Alexandra Park. That's, that's not really a location or area. And so uh, he, he suggested a new name. And uh, I spoke with Pastor McGrath about it, what he thought about it, and he was all for it as well. And so I'm going to announce a new name for our church starting from today. And so the name of our church starting from this moment forward is going to be the Potter's House Church Central. Praise the Lord. And so God's going to be moving. Amen. That's us. 
And so uh, good things are going to be happening. Good things are going to be moving forward. Eventually, we'll change it all on the YouTube page and all that stuff. And then the, all the, everything, all the accounts and everything will stay the same. But just over the next few months, we'll start to change everything over. Uh, but where do we go to church? We're at Central, baby. This is how we're at. And uh, God's going to help us. Amen. Who's ready for the word of God? Say amen. amen. Praise God. Let's turn to Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 40. Luke 6, 40. Uh, in the NBA playoffs that are on at the moment, and uh, Golden State Warriors have made it to the, uh, to the conference finals, just in case anyone was wondering about my team. Um, but they, in, when they have the games in the NBA, their, their series, they have a best of seven series. So they play seven games, and whoever wins four games gets through. You know, in rugby, it's just one game. Imagine doing that seven times against the same team. And so that's what they do in the NBA. And uh, Golden State was doing really, really good. In game three, we won by 30 points, which is... Almost as bad as when Melbourne Storm slapped the Warriors a couple of weeks ago. It was very embarrassing for the other team. Um, but a couple of games later, just four days later, Memphis, the team we were playing, remember we won by 30. Four days later, Memphis, the other team, beat us by 39 points. We got slapped harder. Like there was, It was absolutely horrible. It was one of our biggest losing margins ever. Now think about this. How did we go from winning by 30... A couple of days later, losing by nearly 40. I think that's, that's interesting. Then there was a game yesterday, and we won that game by like 15. So there's incredible victory, then incredible loss, but then incredible victory. Now, the key in the NBA in these seven-game series, the key is making adjustments, is that not every game is the same. Yeah, okay, we're playing. This works in this game, but what we did in this game might not work in the next game. What we tried, it wasn't working in this game. Let's try something else for the next game. And what makes a good coach is that he has the ability to, to make the right adjustments. That's what makes a good coach. A bad coach does the, just does the same thing every time, win, lose, or draw. He just does the same thing. A, what makes a good coach is their ability to make adjustments, the right adjustments. Can I say, what makes a good disciple is their ability to make the right adjustments. It works in the sports realm, and it works in the spiritual realm. What makes you great? is not by being just perfect every day. It is by making adjustments to tailor to the situation that you find yourself in. The word adjustment means a small alteration or movement made to achieve a desired fit, appearance, or result. I'm going to talk about adjustments this morning. So let's, let's read. We're going to preach a sermon I've entitled Making Adjustments. And my prayer is that whatever you find yourself, if you're winning or losing, I pray that you make these adjustments and will step into the plans of God. Let's look at Luke 6:40. Jesus said, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained, and if you have your Bible, I encourage you to highlight those two words, perfectly trained, highlight that in your Bible, perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do, do not perceive the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye, when you, you yourself do not see the plank that is in your eye? Hypocrite! First remove the plank that is in your own eye. And then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. Let's pray. God, we're grateful for the word of God. And I pray, Lord, help us to have the humility, God, and the grace, God, to make adjustments in our life. In every area, God, that you may be glorified. We give you all the praise and all the honor. Those that don't know you this morning, I pray, draw them closer to you, God. They could have a relationship with you. We thank you for what you're going to do. In the mighty name of Jesus. Everybody says with a shout. Amen. Amen. Three points this morning. Let's look firstly at required adjustments. Required adjustments. And how many here you're glad that Jesus doesn't change? Isn't that good news that God doesn't change? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The reason he doesn't change is because he can't get any better. He's the best. And there's nothing about God that we want to improve on. Because if he could improve, that means he's not the best today. But God is the greatest. In Psalm 145 verse 3, God, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable or beyond our understanding. Saying that's, that's the type of God he is. He is so great, we can't even fathom how great he is. He is incredible. His greatness is unsearchable. He is greatly to be praised. That's how God is. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And thank God for that. But my issue is some people think they are great just like Jesus. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But I know some people, they're the same yesterday, today, and forever. No change because they're great. They don't need a change, right? Of course. They're perfect. Anyone know these people? Elbow them. Elbow them right now, okay? So they're perfect for every situation. They're perfect for every, every, all the past. They're, they're perfect in wisdom. They're perfect in their marriage. They're perfect in their children. 
They're perfect in their Bible reading, in their prayer life, in their fasting, in their devotion. They're perfect in their future. They're perfect. And some people actually believe that because, and they make no changes in their life. So understand this, church. Life is a continual process of adjustments. It's just you're continually adjusting. You're continually making small adjustments in life. If you don't adjust in life, if you stay the same, tell them you have a horrible life. It's horrible. You'll be in a constant cycle. You know what I'm talking about. You know how when you have a problem with that sister, then you have a problem with another sister, then you have a problem with another sister, and then another sister. Because all the sisters are horrible. But you're perfect. You don't need to adjust. They need to adjust their attitude. Oh, well, come on now. Or you serve God at one church, then you serve God at another 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 church. Man, all these churches suck. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Obviously, you don't need to adjust. It's the church that needs to adjust. Finances. You get up for a bit, back into debt. Go back a bit, back into debt. Go in and back into debt. Oh, come on, somebody. And this is how we go. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing, but expecting a different result. I was counseling someone, and I said to this brother, mark my words, you are insane. In Jesus' name. I go, you're doing the same thing, and you expect your life to be different? You're insane. That's the definition. You. Raise your hand if you know someone insane. Like, you know, they just do the same. Oh, everyone's scared to raise their hands now. Thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate someone helping me out here. All the husbands are like, I'm... do I amen this sermon or do I just... <laughs> so understand this, true. We have to make adjustments. If you want something you've never had, you need to do some things you've never done. So you need to adjust. Some people, they're not hitting their target. I'll just keep doing the same thing. You're not going to get there. If you eat Maccas every day, oh, come on, somebody. You are not going to reach your level. It's not going to get there. Oh, no, I believe one day. I'm gonna, I tell you what, I'm so proud of our church. I, I can tell our church loves souls. Our church loves souls. Do you know why our church loves souls? Because no one's losing weight in the challenge. Because you love I can see. Because it's all about souls. It's not about weight loss. It's all about... It's all about all right, so we need to make adjustments in life. Okay, <laughs> nah, some of you are like trying to pull it back. Oh, no, there's a chin. Yeah, I swear. So we need to make adjustments. The first adjustment is obviously salvation, right? We need to adjust to that. Luke 13, 3, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. That's deep words from Jesus. You need to adjust for salvation. We need to make a change. It's not like, oh, I love God and that's enough. No, he says you need to repent. Repentance is a major adjustment. And when you're a new convert, it's good. You start changing some things. You, you stop smoking. You stop drinking. You stop swearing. You stop kicking the dog. You, start, you stop doing these things. You're a more nice human being. You've changed a little bit. You stop fornicating. You stop doing these things because you're making an adjustment to salvation. That's great. But that is not the end. That's the beginning. Our text is actually talking about discipleship. Look at our text again, verse 40. A disciple is not above his teacher. But everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Now, I've spoken, I speak about discipleship all the time. And the word disciple means learner, apprentice, or student. Okay? Is one who accepts instruction and makes it their rule of conduct. Now, maybe before we get to any further in our, in our sermon, first, are you a disciple? Are you a learner, or do you don't need to learn? You've got it. Are you a student? Or you got this thing sorted out, you're, you're fine. Like, I'd, you, you're giving other people advice. Are you, and if you are a disciple, who are you a disciple of? Because I have some people that come to me on the street, hey, pastor, I'm not your pastor. You don't listen to anything I say. I preach sermon after sermon. You don't, you don't listen to nothing. My name's Dan. Nice to meet you. I'm not your pastor. I'm the guy, the pastor Greg says, you should call me the guy at the front who speaks. Because that's all, that's, that's all that happens. But discipleship is I'm learning and I'm accepting instruction and making that the rule of my conduct. Someone else said, a disciple is one who, who has absorbed the spirit of his teacher. But as being one who is a disciple, he remains under his teacher for the thing that makes him what he is, he has received and he will always have received from his teacher. What he realizes is what I have has been given to me. And so a disciple can't be greater than his teacher because what he has has been given. But as the teacher grows, so does the disciple grow. 
So this is a spiritual element and there's a practical element in our text that says everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Now I know you're saying perfectly trained. Who's perfect, perfectly trained? Well, this word perfectly trained in the Greek, you put that up for me, Gracie. I'm not even going to try and say it. It's that first word. The word perfectly trained means to adjust. The people who adjust will be like their teacher. The people who adjust will be like the person who's discipling them, who have their spirit and their strength and their dominion. Only those who adjust. The problem is people refuse to adjust, and so they refuse to be disciples. Pastor Mitchell is one of his famous quotes. He says, Christianity is not about what you are today. It's what you can become, right? Thank God for that. Thank God that our hope is not in who I am right now. It is, I've got many ways to, to grow, and thank God for that. And the way you do that is through making adjustments. It's not just a natural, I'll just wake up, and every day I wake up, I'm just better. It's not by accident. It's intentional. So when should you make an adjustment? Two times you should make an adjustment in life. Number one, if you are failing, make an adjustment. Don't just keep failing. Do you know someone like that? They keep caking it, but they're not going to change. You know, in, in the NBA, like if you're, if you're playing basketball and you're losing a game, the coach can call a timeout. They're saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, let's have a chat. What we thought we were going to do, scrap that. Let's do something different because we're losing. I really felt for the Warriors that night against Melbourne Storm. I was like, can we call a timeout? Can we do something like just, can someone play defense? Anyone want to play defense? We were getting random people to kick for goal. Did you realize? Like, it was so embarrassing. But in life, if you're failing, call a timeout and make an adjustment. Don't just keep failing. Get, get some wisdom. The problem is we take failure so personal. If I failed, I'm just a horrible human being. No, you're not. We all failed. We've all made mistakes. But failing is an event. It's an event. It is not your character. It is not your life. It's not who you are. But because we're so scared of, and we're so intimidated by failure and we take it so personally, so we hide our failures. I don't want anyone to see my failures. Let me help you out. Ray Charles could see it. And he's blind. I don't want anyone to see. You don't think we can see? You don't think we notice? You don't think we could see that? Look what Jesus explains. It. I love this. Verse 42. How do you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye. And you yourself, you have a plank that is in your own eye. Here's this guy telling people what to do. You have a plank in your face. And you think no one can see. He goes, dude, you're a hypocrite. Remove it. Remove the plank and then do that. But do you notice here that Jesus doesn't say, you're a hypocrite. I never want to talk to you ever again. He says, you're failing hard. Remove the plank and then adjust and move forward. Just because there's a failure doesn't mean it's the end. Failure is part of life. It's part of success. And if you're not failing, I promise you, you're not succeeding. It's just part of life. So don't ignore your problems. My marriage is really bad, but I'm just not going to say anything and pray one day it gets better. What? Good luck with that one. I get the phone call when she's left like three months ago. Pastor, I'm struggling. Can you help me with my marriage? Yeah, sure. What's up? Well, she left me three months ago. What? You should have noticed some things before. You need to adjust yourself before in your finances. When you start to realize that you're spending a bit too much, make an adjustment. Don't go on a spending spree. Oh, come on, somebody. In your spirit, if you feel yourself going a bit lukewarm, don't be like, you know what? I'm just going to stay home from church and just see what happens. Yeah. How, has that ever helped? Ever. One time in the history of all mankind. Yeah, we think that it's going to help us. So don't ignore it. If your spirit's off, speak to someone that could help you. Do, adjust. Fast. Pray. Do something you haven't done. Listen to this. You can't improve what you choose to ignore. If you choose to ignore it, it's never going to get better. In fact, it's going to get worse. So if you're failing, make an adjustment. The second time you should make an adjustment is if you're winning, make an adjustment. Now, wait a second, Pastor. You said if I'm failing, I'll make an adjustment. So I am winning. Correct. But the problem is when you're successful, you oversee all your problems. You, you, that your, your problems are covered. You miss all your flaws because you're like, hey, I was successful. So everything I did must have been perfect to get me to this stage. That's not true. There's a great book. It's called What Got You Here Won't Get You There. What that, that is a great book. And I encourage you all to read it. It talks about how you can be successful to this point of life. But if you want to be successful to this, the second point, the second stage of life, you might need to do some different things. All right. So what made you strong as a new convert in your first year won't make you strong as a new convert in your second year. Things change. He says in the, in the book, the behaviors and discipline that got you to one level 
won't necessarily be the same behaviors and disciplines to get you to the next level. Okay? Okay, think about this. If you pass level grade two, right, should you just work at grade two level for the rest of your life? Of course not. Every year it gets harder, right? You have to change. You can't be in high school in year 12 and year 13 having a grade two mentality. I know some of you tried it. It didn't work. It didn't work, did it? It didn't work out well. Because the more you, further you go, the more you have to adjust. And when you achieve, you have to adjust even more. Pastor Mitchell passed away in 2020. He sent out 3,000 churches. Didn't have a church of 3,000 people. He sent out 3,000 churches. We can't comprehend that. Tens or hundreds of thousands of people. Imagine all the disciples that he's made. He sent out 3,000 churches. In the last year of his life, when he was 90 years old, he read three books on discipleship. You tell me one man who's discipled men better than him. Anyone. But he's still humble enough to realize if he's going to stay successful, he needs to adjust. So regardless of how successful you are in life, you need to learn to adjust. Many of you know that that annoying train game on the phone, you know the one you have to jump the train and get the coins and it gets faster than the chain. You've got to jump and duck and swipe and all that. You know exactly what I'm talking about. That game. And you start, it's nice and slow, it's easy, but it gets harder and harder and harder and harder. Right? That's life. You, you need to learn to adjust more and more and more and more. And the strongest people are those that are willing to adjust. The weakest people that are, are those that are rigid. So let's look secondly at recommended adjustments. One, number one, required adjustments. Number two, recommended adjustments. Pastor, what areas should I adjust my life? Great question, guys. Really good. I appreciate that. Three things. Number one, how about we adjust our kindness? <laughs> Think how much your life would change if you were just a kinder person. I felt some people right there. I am kind. <laughs> Imagine how much your marriage would change if you were kind. Very quiet in church this morning. Imagine the change in your marriage if you were just a really nice person to be around. You were just kind, just lovely, just a sunflower of joy. Imagine how much your ministry would change if you were kind. If you were, if you were kind. Ephesians 4.31. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away with you with all malice. And be kind to one another. Be kind to one another. Tender hearted. Forgiving one another. Even as God in Christ forgave you. Let's actually talk about marriage at some points here. Just be kind to one another. Forgiving. Just be kind. Do you know, do you, do you know being kind is free? Smiling is free. Saying thank you won't cost you any money. <laughs> Why is it so quiet for? Why is it? I'm feeling God dealing with some people right now. It's like, I'm a horrible person, right? That kindness, remember this, kindness is maturity. When you're kind to people, yeah, that's, that's true maturity. Those that are harsh, they're not mature. They're childish. And when you're kind, you actually step into destiny. It blesses you. David has many stories about this. I'll touch on some tonight. But David, he's running from Saul. Saul comes into the cave where he is. He's trying to kill, kill David. And David has an opportunity right there to kill Saul. But he chooses not to. He cuts his robe and he says, man, that, even that was too much. I should have been kinder. When Nabal, Nabal's being rude to David, and David says, you know, I'm going, to kill all, I'm going to kill you and your household. Everyone's dying. He gets his army ready. He's going to kill this guy. And then Nabal's wife says, listen, don't, don't do this. You're better than this. Don't, don't do this. And he changes and he's kind and he stops. And if he didn't do those things, he wouldn't have been king. So we need to make some adjustments in kindness. In our words, in our face. How many know we can fix our face from time to time? Sometimes our resting face is um, interesting. All right, so kindness, number one. Number two is another area that we can adjust is effort. Someone said this, the difference between a successful person and others is not a lack of strength, not a lack of knowledge, but rather a lack of will. You have to want and desire success more than everyone else does. Be persistent, be ruthless, train with passion, heart, and rage you will see improvements. Unfortunately, we like to give minimal effort, but have a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, blessing come back to us. I want my productivity to be high, but the minimal effort, right? What's the least I could do and the most return? Don't view life like that. View life like what's the most I can give. View life like that. I'm telling you, your life will be radically different. We all know Colossians 3.23, and whatever you do, do it heartily or do it with all your heart 
as to the Lord and not to men. So imagine if we just put a little bit more effort into some of these areas, like as if it was towards God. Imagine when you were doing the dishes tonight, imagine if it was Jesus that was going to see the dishes afterwards. <laughs> Got very quiet again, all right. Imagine in your marriage, if you just put a bit more effort in. Imagine if you just read a book about marriage and just try and find, just effort, or ask some questions, or cleaned up after yourself one time. The wives would be like, you dying? Everything okay? What's, what's happening? You did just something, just a bit more effort. Imagine if in ministry you put a bit more effort in, just to adjust. Instead of, oh, I quit then because obviously I'm not good enough. Or maybe you just put more effort in and you will be good enough. Just adjust your effort. Did you know, if you practiced anything 30 minutes a day, you would be, you, your growth would, would be extremely evident. Just 30 minutes a day. Now I know what you're thinking. Pastor, I don't have 30 minutes a day. I'm busy. I understand. So in, life, in every day, we have 1,440 minutes. 1,440 minutes per day. You have that every single day. If you give 30 minutes to something... That's 2% of your day. Do you have 2% of your day to work on your marriage? Do you have 2% of your day to work on your songs? Do you have 2% of your day to work on your ministry, on our media, on your ushering, on following up, on your prayer life, in Bible reading? 2%. God asks us for 100%. And we struggle to give Him two. A little bit of effort. What about when you have temptations? Instead of just giving in every time, how about just put a bit of effort in? How about we just put a bit of effort? How about we stop saying, oh, I don't know, I just wasn't thinking. How about you just pretend and try? How about we try that one? How about we adjust and put effort? And finally, I know no one here needs to hear this, but the third area that we could adjust is our attitude. No one here. This is for the church down the road. Somewhere else. No one here. Everyone here's attitude is... All right? I've used this before. There's in... Um, in, uh, in airplanes, they have all the, the, all the stuff on the dashboard, and they have one, one of these circle things, and uh, it's called, it's actually called the attitude indicator. Now, when, since when does a plane have an attitude indicator? That's a bit weird. Well, actually, the attitude indicator shows the direction of the plane. So if the gauge is above the line, that means the plane's nose is going up. When its attitude is high, the nose is going up. When this attitude is below the black line, that means the plane is coming down. And you'll see it on the wings. You see the big, the flaps at the back of the wings. That's actually part of the attitude indicator, because when it's it's flapped the right way, the plane goes up. When it's flapped the wrong way, the plane goes down. The direction of the plane is determined by the attitude of the plane. So the direction of a disciple is determined by the attitude of the disciple. It's your attitude. You have a good attitude, life goes up. You have a bad attitude, things go down. How you view life, you have to understand how you view life. If you have a good attitude about things things get better. If you have a bad attitude about it, things get much worse. I understand some of us, we have to drive a little bit further to get to church. I get that. I know sometimes it's annoying. I get it. But imagine if you just put an audio book on in the car. It takes me another, an extra 10, 15 minutes to get to church now. You could read a whole book in, in a week or two. So just say, just say two weeks. You could read 24 books this year. Imagine you read five books on marriage, six books on discipleship, 10 books on, on self-discipline. Imagine the type of person you'd be. Oh man, the third, 15 minutes in traffic. Oh. But if our attitude changes, you can be great. You could be amazing. But it's, it starts with your attitude. So let's close with the results of adjustments. Jesus has some awesome words here. He says, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. He doesn't say that you can't remove the speck in your brother's eye. He says remove the plank first and then do that. So this gives us a great lesson, something you need to apply to your life. When you make personal adjustments, you can do things you were unqualified to do before. Some of you think, man, I can't do that. I can't do that. That's true now. But if you make adjustments, you can do that. You can't do that in the situation you're in today. You can't do that in the way that you're living now. But you, you change some attitudes, you change some effort, you change some kindness, and I'm telling you, you'll, you'll be able to do things you never dreamed possible, never ever dreamed possible. Change, growth, and maturity, and, and all these things come to place. Yesterday, I had a great day yesterday. 
<clears throat> brother Sefo and Anna got married yesterday. It was an awesome, awesome time. He got, they got saved on March 30th, six weeks ago. Sefo was telling me the week before they got, they got saved in our service, he was looking to book tickets to move to Australia as to break up. That's the level it was. Then they made an adjustment of salvation. Things got better. They made an adjustment to become a disciple, and I'm going to be at church when church is open. I'm going to be there. He's praying. He's coming. He got a word from Pastor Plummer because things are changing. You could see it. He's moving forward. He came and spoke to me. Pastor, we need to get married. And look at the adjustment in six weeks. That's what happens when you adjust. Six weeks, your life could be completely different. Six weeks. Six weeks. That's all it takes. You know, someone said this, life isn't about finding yourself, it's about creating yourself. You create yourself through consistent, uh, constant and consistent adjustments. I just need to find myself. No, if you find yourself, yourself is horrible. I don't want to find myself. There's a lot of bad in Dan. There's a lot of bad. But I need to create myself. I need to create my marriage. I need to create my ministry. I need to create my future. I need to create my discipleship through making these adjustments. There's a book by James Clear, and I, I love this book, and I think I've used this. I, I think I used it at the start of the lockdown a couple of years ago. But he speaks about habits, and he speaks about being 1% better or 1% worse each day. And he talks about how powerful one, just 1% every day can change your life. There's a graph here. Do we have that picture here, Gracie? I'm sure if you could see that. So basically, they also, these two lines here, they start at the same spot. 1% improvement is the one at the top. 1% decline is at the bottom. This is over one year. If you get better by 1%, 15 minutes a day, 15 minutes, it's actually 14. 1% every day, over one year, you will be 37 times better than you are today. Not twice as good, not five times as good, not 10, 37 times better with 15 minutes a day, 1%. If you get 1% worse per day, this, that's pretty scary, you go from 1 to 0 0.03. That's 33 times worse. Think about that. 1% adjustment, up or down, you could be either 37 times better or 33 times worse. So I encourage you to make an adjustment. And you choose which adjustment you're going to make. You 15 minutes, 1% every day. I'm telling you, your life will be radically different. Don't ignore your problems. Don't push them to the side. Suss your problems. Sort out your problems. Adjust. And just because you lose doesn't mean you're always going to lose. You might lose today. But if you adjust, you might win next week. But if you don't adjust, you'll lose this week, next week, and the week after, and the year after. But I don't want to be the same at the end of the year. I want to keep growing. How many here you want to keep growing? You say amen. amen. If you give this, if you apply this sermon, I'm telling you, your life will be radically different. 1% better. Make adjustments. Amen. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No one moving around just for the next few moments. Quickly, there's people here. You are unsaved or backslidden. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. No one's moving around. No one's looking around. The band's going to come. We're going to sing a song of worship in just a moment. But the people here, you are unsaved. And you know that if you died, you will not make heaven your home. You know, there's sin in your life. Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he will not enter the kingdom of heaven. My question is, are you born again? And if you can't answer that truthfully, my brother, you, you will not make heaven your home. My sister, that's what Jesus said. So you're saying, Pastor, how do I, how do I get to heaven? If Jesus said, I must be born again, and I don't even know what that means. If I'm not born again, how does that, how does that apply to me? Well, Jesus said, being born again means you repent from your sin, you turn, you change. You pray a simple prayer of repentance, but then you live for God wholeheartedly. Not perfectly, but wholeheartedly. That you make major adjustments to your life. Like Sephel, he changed things. He got saved and he changed things. Six weeks later, married. But our first point of adjustment is salvation. There's people here, you are unsaved or backslidden. You're away from God. Maybe you're backslidden. You, want, you once knew the love of God, but you're not. You, come on, you know that. You know it, I know it, everyone knows it, God knows it. And we can play games with God. Don't hide the failure because you can't improve what you hide. So there's people here, you're unsaved or backslidden. But the good news, my brother or my sister, is that God loves you so much. And you can, you can have your name written in heaven right now. 
we can lead you in a simple prayer and you could have you could have all your sins washed away you could every guilty thing you've ever been ever done every bad word jesus even spoke about our thoughts if they have bad thoughts he's going to remove all of them in one moment of time that's how powerful the blood of jesus is so quickly that's you you're unsaved or backslidden you know you need to get your heart right with god quickly that's you would you get your heart right with god would you raise your hand up say pastor that's me i need to get my heart right quickly all through this place raise it up so i can say amen thank you brother praise god amen how many more you raise your hand up say amen thank you sisters on this side praise god how many others god's dealing with your heart amen thank you sister praise god hallelujah god is moving how many more you need to get your heart right with god raise it up nice and i join these other honest hearts say pastor that's me thank you my brother on this side my sister on this side praise god god is moving amen thank you sister hallelujah how many more god's dealing with your heart don't push god away he loves you so much if you just respond to the love of god if you respond to his peace respond to his invitation He's willing that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. He wants you to come to repentance today. This is your moment. Quickly, raise your hand up. Say, Pastor, that's me. I'm going to get it right. I'm not putting this off any longer. I want my name written in heaven. Thank you, my sister. Praise God. Sisters on this side. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Many hands went up. All those that raised your hand, would you come out of your seat? Look up at me if you raise your hand. Come out of your seat. Someone's going to pray with you. Brother, come out of your seat. Brothers at the back here. The sisters at the back here. Would you come out? We need many altar workers to come. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Just come kneel down here. Lekka, would you pray with our sister on this side? Amen. Hallelujah. Over here, the many girls on this side, please. Noah, would you help us help us with the ladies here as well? Praise God. Amen. Amen. Awesome. 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 Amen. Amen. T with you. Oh, Chaz, you got it here. Amen. Praise God for all these precious souls giving their life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you're like, man, I really want what these guys are getting. They're getting hope from God. I want that hope. You can come out of your seat and you can come kneel down here. Someone will pray with you. Quickly, there's people, people here, I feel God's still talking to you. You need to get some things right with God. Talking to the church now. In life, we never make it. We're not Jesus. We're not the same yesterday, today, and forever. We constantly need to change. I'm trying to change as much as I can. And if my future is going to be any good as the pastor of this church, as the husband to my wife, as the father to my children, as a disciple of Jesus, I need to change and adjust constantly. When things aren't going well, make a change. Don't just stay in, the, in problem situations and stay the same. Don't stay the same. Make some changes. Things aren't working out in relationships. Make some changes in kindness, in love, <coughs> in, humidity, in humility. Maybe you're doing well in life and you think, maybe I don't need to make so many changes. No, keep making those changes. Keep making those changes and you'll see God bless your life. Let's be humble enough to make changes in the good and bad. Be a disciple. A disciple makes adjustments. Be open to adjustments. Be open. Okay. Can you see something in my life that I need to change? I need to get right. And if you adjust 1% better over this next year, you'll be 37 times the man, the woman that you were once were. That's what's available through making adjustments. Amen. You can look up. Praise God. These altars are open. If God spoke to you, let's make some time a private prayer at this altar. Let's come out of our seats. Let's pray. Let's believe God to help us. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, Lord. God, we need you, Lord. You speak with God. Spend some time with God. Talk out to God. Tell Him the areas that you need to improve. Tell Him the areas that you need to work on. I need a change in this area, God. God, help me. Help me in these areas. Help me in my marriage. Help me in raising my children. Help me in my faithfulness. Help me in these areas. And you see the Lord bless you. Hallelujah. Plenty of room down the front. Come and let's kneel down. Let's talk to God. If you prayed that prayer, I encourage you to stay down at the altar and just talk to God. Tell Him what's on your heart. Ask Him for help. Talk to Him like, like you're just talking to someone normal.
as long as you need with God. Talk about the adjustments. It's going to help us. Amen. When you finish praying, you can stand and sing with us. Take as long as you need.
that we can make adjustments, that we don't have to be the same person the rest of our lives, that the weaknesses that we have in life, if we just adjust, make some adjustments, they can actually become our strengths. The, the part there is your strong in, does, uh, it's not just an accident. It's not, oh, just God made me, that person strong and just made me weak in that area. No, you could be strong in all those areas because we have God on our side. You just remove some stuff, get, get perfectly trained through adjustments. And man, you can skyrocket to areas you never thought possible. How good would it be to be 37 times the person you are today, man? Thank, I, I pray that happens to our church. It's just 1%. 1% is, is 14 minutes. What can we do every day? What can we get better at? 14 minute, minutes reading a book. 14 minutes in prayer. 14 minutes investing in our marriage. 14 minutes investing in our ministry. Whatever it is. That's a very low bar. But consistency is key. Amen. I appreciate you guys. We're going to have a great night tonight. Great to be in the house of God. I hate these times where we have to close the service. I just want to stay here for like another 17 hours. But we'll um, go have some lunch. Eat, eat a lot because it's all about souls, right? And uh, <laughs> It's good. It's maturity in our church. Amen. But we're going to have a big week ahead. But let's come out tonight. Tell someone about Jesus. And uh, tonight we're going to have some. God's going to move tonight. I really feel the Holy Spirit's going to touch some people tonight. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Close off in a word of prayer. As we pray, I'm going to ask uh, Lanik if you could seal us off in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we give you thanks for this time to build up your word in praise. We thank you for this time, Lord, to receive your word and apply it in our yes, lives. Lord Jesus. Our walks, Lord. Go our thoughts, Lord, whatever yes. that may be, yes, to develop our souls, Lord, yes, and our lives. Lord, I ask you, may you be in the midst of our fellowship. May you guide us back to the center. May you give back all the praise in Jesus' name. We all say, Amen. Amen. Lord bless you. Have a great afternoon. To say is thank you, Lord. What shall I say unto my Father? It's all I have to say is thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. See, all I have to say is thank.